Good uh, afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us on uh, this uh, second uh, effort to put together the uh, panel discussion of uh, really how uh, 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 representatives from several of the um, notable university pro training programs have made adaptations to the COVID environment. So with us today is we have Dr. Julia Blodgett, who is the clinical assistant professor uh, clinical and of clinical and school psychology at the University of Virginia. And uh, Dr. Blodgett will be actually um, not on video sharing. She's a uh, true form to technology is calling in through a patch with my phone on the speaker. So that'll all be interesting. And then Dr. Sarah Valley Gray, uh, who is the director of training um, um, in doctoral programs in school psychology and the director of continuing education special projects at Nova University. And then finally, Dr. Nathan Roth, who is the Assistant Professor of Psychology and the Director of the McKee Assessment and Psychological Services Clinic at Western Carolina University. Uh, so the goals of the, today's presentation, excuse me, <coughs> we've asked that the presenters, pardon me, will share their experiences and what they've learned along the way in adjusting to testing and teaching, really, uh, in what we call ROSA, which is Remote On-Screen Administration, uh, in response to the social distancing requirements that have been brought about by the uh, COVID pandemic. So it's designed to be interactive between the panelists as they discuss a range of challenges uh, from the institutional adjustments they've had to make uh, to workflow adjustments, technology hurdles, uh, and so on, and the impact on the university training programs as, as they've made these adjustments. Uh, also issues around protecting personal health information, setting up remote testing, uh, special populations concerns and issues, use of proctors, manipulatives, and other topics. Uh, so as we uh, proceed and the dialogue unfolds, is that some questions we will, that uh, folks uh, have through the Q&A or, uh, or the chat box, uh, we will pose them dur throughout the the dialogue, uh, if it's appropriate, and then after the afterwards, if we have time, we'll open it up to Q and A as well. So you should leave today's presentation with a greater awareness of challenges and some of the solutions developed by the, your colleagues who have and are continuing to adapt their practice activities and teaching activities to serve the needs of clients, the business, and institutions with whom they work. So with that, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Blodgett to give us a quick uh, introduction and. Uh, to describe what her work entails. Go ahead, Julia. Sure. Um, can you hear me okay? I can think so. Oh. I think somebody has to okay. mute. Okay. So, go. can you still hear me? Yep. Hear you very well. Okay. Great. Um, so, I am um, Associate Professor at the University of Virginia, and we are a program in clinical and school psychology, and I teach the cognitive assessment class to our first year students, and then I also supervise our second year students as they do their, inter uh, their assessments through our in-house training clinic. Um, which is uh, an outpatient clinic, and it's multidisciplinary, and so we have a speech language pathology unit and we have a reading unit as the general psychology one and an autism clinic. So all of us have been getting up and running with telehealth in our teaching and our assessment. Um, would you like me to continue talking about this or are we oh, just doing brief Oh, that's a good start. Thank slide? you. For, that's a good start. Thanks. We'll um, go ahead and have uh, Dr. Uh, Valley Gray give us a synopsis. Sure. Hi. Uh, and I'm echoing now. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. So I'm director of the program in school psychology. We have a specialist in a doctoral program in school psych. I also teach the first year cognitive assessment course, um, where we did the We also have a very long clinical program. Um, there are a number of students in that program, and I help support the clinical psych faculty around the assessment process, which this year was quite different than obviously than previous years. Uh, in addition, similar to Julia, we have a school psych assessment clinic. I don't direct that clinic, but all of our students go through that clinic. And so later on, when we talk about clinic kinds of things, I can speak to the process that we've been going through to make this transition. So thank you. And, and finally, Dr. Nathan Roth has unfortunately had to step away, I believe. And um, 
Is that correct, Dr. Roth? No, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, you are here. Okay. Okay. Why don't you go ahead and um, introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Dr. Nathan Roth. I oversee the, the McKee Clinic at Western Carolina University. Uh, we house three graduate programs uh, in school psychology, a master's in clinical psychology, as well as our, our new doctoral program. So we recently made changes to our training sequence with the addition of our doctoral program and then uh, had a nice curveball with COVID. And so we've made a, an additional change to start doing teleassessment. Um, we serve the, the university students on campus, uh, charter schools in the area through our school psychology program as well as uh, individuals in the community. Um, we're fortunate enough to have inherited a speech and hearing clinic, so we have access to one-way mirrors. And uh, five years ago, we installed a video system that has uh, helped immensely um, to the transition to teleassessment. Excellent, thank you very much. So with that, um, uh, we had created a, a series of questions to just kind of get things uh, started to warm us up uh, in, in, the, in the conversation. So uh, you should be able to see these here. Um, so specifically, let's kind of hone in on, you know, how do you, how have you adapted to teaching via remote assessment? Uh, and uh, you know, what's a part of your experience doing that, teaching remote assessment? And uh, whoever wants to go first, uh, Dr. Baji, you want to start? Sure. Um, you know, one of the things I would say is that it has been harder to teaching than it has been to doing the supervision. You might have to mute your uh, your computer while you talk. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. We're getting feedback. Um, my mic is it's the speakers. I have to mute there. Thanks. Okay. Um, so, in terms of the teaching, uh, one of the things that has uh, been a challenge with the teaching is that it is our first year cohort and so in addition to most of them not having any experience with a or foundation there so we're starting um, near the beginning with them they're also new to our program so another challenge that we've been facing is how do we get them feeling more included in our program community and the community more broadly um, and some of the adjustments I think um, had just been difficult along those lines because we have a very hands-on model for our cognitive assessment program and typically they're doing a lot of practice testing with volunteers in the community and haven't been feeling as comfortable having them do that with COVID um, and while they're comfortable being in the classroom and my TA is comfortable being in the classroom I'm not as comfortable being in the classroom mm -hmm. at this point um, they're very much a bubble the students in the program and so they've been doing a lot of practice with each other. And they've also been practicing with people in their bubble outside of the program. Um, ordinarily, I do not support practicing IQ, cognitive test administration with roommates and partners. And so I gave instructions that I want those people to throw the evaluation, to do something that would compromise hmm. the realness of it <laughs> so that people go in knowing that the results aren't going to be you know, the truth per se. Um, we're also very lucky to have a camera setting in our clinic, and so students have been able to go into our clinic, administer tests to each other, while I can watch through the camera system and through our telehealth program, I can give them feedback as we're doing that live. Um, and so that's been one of the, the major adjustments that we've done. Weather is going to be here beautiful here tomorrow. We're going to have class outdoors, and uh, we'll be doing a demonstration of the KABC in this new venue. Excellent. I'm very eager to hear what other people are doing. Dr. Roth, you want to take a, take, take a shot? Sure. Um, we're doing a lot, a lot of what Dr. Bodge just mentioned. Uh, we're doing very uh, similar practice. So uh, first years are in that bubble. Um, we're very fortunate to have our, uh, third year, our first year doctoral students in the third year of our program um, who have had several practicum experiences in the clinic, which has helped immensely. Um, one thing we did was created a hierarchy of supervision, which has been very important in the process. Uh, supervision has been amplified uh, greatly. I mean, the amount of time I've spent supervising clients or students has, has gone, uh, has practically doubled in this process. So what we did was create a, again, a supervision model where our third year doctoral students in their first year of the doctoral program are able to um, work with teams. And what we did was we've actually paired our second year students are in the clinic. Um, and by pairing them and using that video system, it's allowed us to not only let them 
with clients, but reduce the amount of assessments we're requiring of them in the clinic. And then they have a partner who also gets to watch along on the video system, score with them. They can communicate with each other to help out. There's an issue with test administration technology um, while the client is in the clinic. We have that, that support system in place. And then in the in addition to that, that, that doctoral student is there as well to provide feedback in the process. So after that, after they're finished testing, we get together, we talk about how the testing session went, where, the, where we need to focus our attention moving forward. Um, we've also been able to incorporate the supervision course for our fourth year students, the second year doctoral students, and they help with group supervision. So on top of that whole process, we have the doctoral students talking with one another in this hierarchy uh, about the cases. And then when we meet for supervision, they get that experience of helping guide that supervision. So we're, we're hitting it from every, every layer. Um, and I think the more eyes on these cases, the better. Of course, we talk about that with our clients at the outset and make sure they're aware of all the procedures we have in place. But that has helped immensely with our comfortability providing services to the public is having those extra eyes on those cases and lots of practice uh, before they've ever seen a client. They've come in the clinic, like Dr. Blodgett mentioned, many times to practice video view. Um, and once they kind of hit that, that threshold, we bring, we bring on the, case, the caseload to that client and they can start seeing clients. So kind of a follow up then. So this supervision and consultation model, really, was this a significant <clears throat> change in, in your development of how you provided this? Yeah, so we were, we were fortunate. We just changed into our new sequence and then again had to kind of transition with, with COVID. Um, so there was definitely the biggest hiccup we've had is just scheduling, right? They're, they have other courses, they have other responsibilities, research, and that has always played a role in what their availability is. So that has been the, the number one complaint, I guess I would say, of our students is just finding that time to get together. But over the course of the past month, we've been able to, to address that. What I strongly advise is, is those weekly check-ins. We, we check in as the faculty team members first, talk about what's, what's going on with our teams. And then we've brought those doctoral students in to have those open, open discussions what's working and what's not. Um, and I think that has really helped limit the stress but they're naturally gonna feel overwhelmed. I think our students are overwhelmed, period, during this pandemic and, and navigating mm -hmm. classes um, has added a layer of stress. Um, but again, I think the scheduling has been our, been our most difficult aspect, but we've been able to work through that for the most part. Okay, thank you. And uh, sir, Dr. Servai? <clears throat> yeah, one of the things that we struggled with most is we spent the summer trying to make sense of how are we going to make assessment work not being in person was the fact that this is their first assessment course and we emphasize the importance of a standardized administration and by virtue of this um, of covid and not necessarily having much standardized control over anything uh, how do we ensure that students really take that message away you know, because we've, we've had to be really, we have to be really flexible in this process. Um, you know, because what happens is, is that some of our students are coming in in person. Some of our per students are um, via Zoom. Some of our students mm -hmm. didn't move to campus. So that variability of access to the test kits is significant. So some of our students have a test kit, they've picked them up and they are able to administer a hard copy, whereas other students uh, have a remote access and they have access to Kids Global. So it's been challenging, um, similar to what both Julia and Nathan had talked about, was um, the use of other students in terms of a supervision model. And so in the context of that first year course, we always pair up students so that they can get a lot of detailed feedback around the standardized administration and scoring. And that also allows for ensuring that as students move through the curriculum, they retain those skills as well. This year, we've added um, the GoReact platform to the assessments, and that allows for very targeted, specific feedback with timestamps on what students are able to do and the challenges around that. So that's the course. And then in terms of our clinic, um, you know, we have made it, we are in a hot spot, we're in South Florida. And so yeah. things have been quite challenging here. So we have given students the ability to indicate whether they want to come in or whether they want to be virtual. Students who do come in, you know, we obviously put in a lot of protective practices in place uh, and we will do a regular administration. 
but if they're not comfortable coming in, they can do some interviews and things like that, or there are competencies that we've developed that mimic the standardized assessment process that students will have access to. Can you give an example of uh, one, one of those competencies? Competencies, yeah. So during the summer, we were really one of the leaders, and Florida always is some, does some crazy thing in the world, but this time it was the crazy thing was, uh, you know, we were number one in terms of COVID cases right behind New York. Um, as a result of that, we our clinic was not open. Uh, students could not do their typical practicum placement. And so one of the our faculty members, who's the associate director of our clinic, she took each of the activities someone would engage in in a typical practicum placement and created modules and training activities around it. So for example, it might mean learning new measures. It might, and so they had a task where they literally had to learn a new measure and demonstrate competency around that. It would also include a comprehensive biopsychosocial. So they had to conduct a mock biopsychosocial. And then there were packets of assessment um, materials that had been used with actual clients pre-pandemic. And so those packets were made available with all of the information, all the data, and then students would write up the cases. I see. Yeah. Excellent. So we had lots of different strategies to get at the same competencies they would get at if they were in the clinic, but they were done virtually. Yeah. Excellent. Do, uh, does anybody else uh, want to kind of add or respond? Um, Pat, can I jump in with a question for Dr. Bellingham? We've had a couple of questions asking about the particular software that you mentioned. Which software is it or what technology are you using that is providing feedback with timestamp? Okay. Yeah, so the name of the technology is called Go React, G O, and then R E A C T. And uh, I think the gentleman, you can email Parker, P-A-R-K-E-R, -E at goreact.com. I don't get any pickback. <laughs> but <laughs> I can tell you that, you know, we, we are using it currently for our cognitive assessment course. We looked at it initially for an introductory interviewing course. And I had my grad students who helped me out with that course, and they fell in love with it. Because it really allows you to give nice feedback specific to, say, in the case of comment assessment to the standardized administration, and in the case of interviewing, um, you know, like there was a rupture in the alliance there, or nice job with empathy, or whatever it might be. And it's not these broad brush statements, but students are really able to walk away knowing what they did well and what they need to work on. So it actually it kind of aligns it right to the interaction you're observing. So they can, like, record it and see where the comment is related to their behavior? It, right, it, it matches up identically, yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah. All right, so uh, what are some of the top things you guys have been learning from your experience? Just open it up, who wants to go first? I'd like to add um, that I feel like we've been very, very successful with the adaptation in our clinic. The materials that, you know, being able to have access to the digital materials, having the guidance at the beginning, having resources in the form of other colleagues and some of the professional agencies out there has been very helpful. But I think one of our biggest resources has been our students who are so motivated to continue providing services to clients and to continue building on their training that they've been very impressive in their willingness to practice and practice the telehealth administration skills so that they get them very, very smooth, that they also um, are such supports to each other. Like if one student creates an infrastructure in terms of how to arrange all of the things on the screen, what order to follow, what page to go to, they're sharing that with each other so that students aren't having to reinvent the wheel they're creating Google Drive folders so that people can access the resources that are there more easily. Um, and we also had a lot of support from our clinic director. None of us had done telehealth before, but he had done a lot of it. And he was right there getting us the HIPAA-compatible platform, getting us additional resources, for example, so that we could have um, 
laptops at home to help with this work laptops. Mm -hmm. um, but really just going back to the students, they've made it possible for us to do so many assessments of clients in the community who had imminent needs in terms of documentation requirements or need for services in the school. And another thing that we did is that we reached out early to make sure that the agencies we'd be interacting with would accept telehealth. So reached out to the local public schools to ask them, you know, students needing accommodations for a, a national licensing exam, reaching out to that agency to make sure that they would take the telehealth. And it's, it's just been marvelous, I think, for us to see the quality of work we've been able to maintain in this new mode. And I would, and Patrick, I would second everything Julia just said. Um, the use of the DAL, DAL U has, has helped immensely for the students to take home practice, um, uh, just to be prepared. Um, you know, with first years, they're just going through their training um, in their second semester, they will join into the clinic activities through observation. So they'll get paired yeah, with some of these teams. In the classroom, stay with us. What was that? That's my CNN, sorry. <laughs> I don't know what happened. CNN is welcome to comment if it's relevant. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. Okay, I would just say that in the second, second semester, they're going to have the opportunity to observe and get acquainted with the clinic and, and get comfortable because that process is difficult going from just learning these and getting this, this down to um, adding those extra variables that come with teleassessment. The other thing we've had done is uh, our teams have all been assigned different assessment measures and they, they work to create a nice breakdown. Of, of all the things that come along with each subtest, things you need to prepare for, the order, how to do them, where to set them. And then those are shared amongst the teams. And so we've kind of divvied up that workload and that has helped a lot too with helping students to prepare. And, and the video system we use is called Vault and it has the same um, kind of features that, that we can watch live, but we can also go back and watch those recordings and our students are highly not expected to go back and do that. And then again, stamp the places where we, they need us to review again, or they have questions, and in particular for us to comment on the things that they've done, like has been mentioned before, that, is, that has helped a lot. Um, and the last thing I'll say is use the hybrid model. With that first session being able to be done in the home, and that's possible, living in the mountains, sometimes that's not the case. It's definitely, it has limited students or clients coming into the clinic, which has helped a lot. So we're able to filter them in, um, in a safe manner where we have only one individual in the room a day um, for the performance-based tasks and that that has helped as well excellent excellent so i have a question follow-up to this so are the students in any of your programs doing any home-based evaluations or is it pretty much through partner clinics and agencies and or on, on campus students are not doing any home-based evaluation okay. um in our clinic we're either doing well home-based, you mean that they're in their homes or that they're going to other well, people's homes? Well, actually, in the spirit of um, uh, COVID, I'm, I'm thinking oh. remote testing with, with evaluees while they are in their home environments. Not necessarily that they're going into the home environments, but they're, they're, they're patching yeah, in. We are routinely, mm -hmm, we're routinely doing that. Students are working from their apartments, um, and they are administering telehealth assessments to children, young adults, older adults who are in their own living environment. Um, and there are occasional glitches. Uh, we have lots of animal lovers in our program, and mm -hmm. so we've had some surprise visits from cats and dogs. Um, but for the most part, it's worked out very well in terms of the technology, and we have support from the university to provide hotspots to any students who might be living in an area where they did not have access, good access to Wi-Fi. And to facilitate that, we've been delivering materials to clients for the administration. So mm -hmm. we've been arranging pickup, drop-off areas to bring, for example, the coding and symbol search booklet if we're going to be doing a WISC administration. Great. Thank you. Others? Um, I, I would say we, we do all of our all of our testing is done in the clinic. The first session is remote in home where we do interviews. We may send them different uh, self reports like the BASC at the end of that interview and have them fill those out. But anything that's performance based, whether it's a cognitive test achievement, um, a CPT three, MMPI, those things are actually done in the clinic. And we have safety procedures in place because we want to 
what property issues. And so again, our, our clients will come into the clinic. We have three different sets of rooms that have been clustered together so that we are only occupying those rooms with one person a day. And we've been fortunate enough to have 12 rooms to be able to cluster those rooms, to have space for everybody to be present and supervise and admit administer the testing. Uh, being behind those one-way mirrors allows us to watch live while we also have the cameras. So th those things have come in very handy. But all of our testing is done there to avoid the mail uh, issues and um, kind of that, that piece at home that that you know, about cat interfering. The nice thing is if there's any issue, it's, it's a misadministration issue or maybe a glitch in technology. And, and we've been doing a hybrid with ours. Um, they, the guideline at the university is that students have choice in whether they want to be distant or um, in person. And it's been one of the scheduling ch challenges because we're trying to match clients who want telehealth with students who want telehealth and clients who want in person with students who want in person. And then we have, you know, similar safety protocol set up in the clinic. And the director of the clinic is actually in the process of having one of the pairs of rooms reconstructed so that instead of the one-way mirror, we have actual glass between the two rooms with a cut open that you can slide open and shut mm -hmm. so that we'd be able to have the examinee in one room, the student being tested or the, you know, the client being tested in the other room and um, each room having its own ventilation system. So yeah, some real capital improvements then in order to facilitate this clearly, yeah. Pat, can I ask a question? Uh, uh, yeah, Peter has a question. Go ahead, Peter. Okay. We're getting this from the audience. Uh, there were questions about remote on-screen administration of tasks that require manipulatives. Uh, what is the panel's view about block design uh, and or uh, uh, memory scales that may require manipulatives? And can we speak about assessments uh, for students who are remote, but they don't have actually have access to physical materials? Thank you. So our clinic has been very clear about um, we are only doing in-person assessments for cognitive assessment. And so, for example, if um, you know to maintain contact with our clients, we will do ongoing check-ins. Uh, they will do biopsychosocials and we'll do rating scales, but we won't do any kinds of measures. It's, you know, cognitive, academic, memory, what have you. They all have to be done in person. So we are dealing with a lot of the issues that have been discussed already. Um, again, students similarly have choice on whether they choose to come in or not come in as do clients. And so we do have to match up the client and the student to come in. Otherwise, they're put on a wait list until things are better. Yeah. And our Thank schools you. just opened up like last week. So we're pretty consistent with what's going on locally. Others? So in response to the question about the manipulative, mm -hmm. um, what I will say is that we miss them greatly in the remote administration. We have mm -hmm. not tried doing block design remotely. Um, we only do that when someone is doing a hybrid or in-person evaluation. Um, it's been great for us to have an approximation of block design with the multiple choice version from the WIS 5 integrated. And then what we try to do is have someone complete something like a ray complex figure test so we can get another look at spatial abilities. And we send a copy of that home with the materials and we have it in a separate envelope so you know they're not seeing it ahead of time um, just to get something about that spatial organization and planning. But we really miss blocks and then also miss some kind of vigilance task. And I think this could be a great opportunity for Pearson to figure out a way of doing remote uh, computer vigilance tasks. The, the market has a need for it. Can you explain uh, your understanding of what that is, just so everybody was on the same page? Computer vigilance or a vigilance task? Uh, the, the vigilance task? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just so everybody's on the same page. Yeah, so um, anytime we have a question of ADHD in our clinic, we have a student take the Connors Continuous Performance Test. In the past, we've done the TOVA, um, and then we switched to the Connors a number of years ago because we really want to see what it's like for students to have to maintain or clients maintain attention to um, 
you know, what I describe as an intentionally tedious or monotonous task, mm-hmm. but I'd like to pay attention to something that might not interest you. And we can get behavioral observations through telehealth assessment. We can ask them to do some sustained activities. We're looking at working memory, but it still feels like an absence to not have something where we're not there to help them stay engaged. It's the client and the computer and interaction there. And I'd I'd be interested to hear what other people are doing to get that type of information. And of course we do behavior checklists also. So thank you. And I there's also a follow-up question there for your colleagues, if you guys want to weigh into it, if you're, if you are doing it, as far as vigilance and whatnot? Right, for our clinic, I, I don't work in the clinic directly, but you know, my understanding is that we would administer any other measures that we typically administer in the clinic, but they'd have to be there. So it's sort of consistent with, with what you know, I was saying before. Okay. okay. So I mean, this is this is a very rich discussion and uh, you're going in some really nice directions as far as how, helping us understand some of the adjustments that you've had to make and whatnot. So what would you say are maybe the top two or three things you didn't know going into this that you've learned about how to do this or about how clinics operate or uh, the training process? There's so much. It's, it's funny. The things we were most worried about as we were preparing to teach the course were not the things that have become the bigger issues and the things we and there were many things we didn't even think about um you know i thought using q global i I, it just didn't dawn on me that we would run into you know the issues of blocks and you know the record forms when it comes to um civil search and so forth we're working around that we're being flexible uh i think students are still getting the the competencies uh and as i mentioned before my only concern is do they have those competencies in a standardized fashion so what we're going to do is that prior to the initiation of the fall semester sometime about three weeks prior during the summer students who did not check out on a paper and pencil measure have to come back to demonstrate competency so that will get at that piece of it um, yeah, yeah. I think the good news and the bad news is the bad news is that we knew nothing about teleassessment uh, and telehealth prior to COVID. And so we quickly had to get individuals in who had expertise in doing that to train our faculty, to train uh, our clinic directors on how best to move forward because there were so many things that we didn't know. It eventually made us quite dangerous. And so having someone come in and, and, you know, we happen to have an alum of ours who has expertise in this area. So he came in and did a number of trainings for our faculty, for the community, so that we would clearly understand our limitations in terms of supervision and, um, you know, the things we had to consider as we were making this very big transition. And so it's, I think it's, it's good that we, you know, potentially are training our students in ways that I think as psychologists, we tend to be very conservative we like the things that we're used to. And so this has pushed all of us in a way that perhaps we would not have otherwise. So, okay, so it's not just me. There's someone going on. No, I'm trying to turn my phone off. Someone's calling me. I'm to turn it off. It's okay. And then the dog barks. I know. Welcome to COVID. Exactly. <laughs> Flexibility is the key. Uh, Others? Yeah, we have a, a question about whether or not anyone is using supplemental subtests instead of those that require manipulatives. For example, figure weights for block design. Mm-hmm. And and how how would you uh, we're manage that? We're trying to expand on the number of cognitive measures that we're giving to try to offset that and just get additional data points and some of them are the supplemental subtests from the waste but we might also weigh from other tests that we that we give as well to try to fill in some Mm -hmm. of those missing points there and it it, in general like there's some things we've had to cut out of our batteries where we frequently use the decaf in the clinic um and so that's been something else that that we've been missing especially hands-on 
like the tower, um, but that's also giving us more time in the evaluation to do some of the supplemental measures from the risk and the waste also. Others? I, I will uh, I just I'd like to alert folks that tomorrow morning, um, morning, I believe it is, uh, we're having a, uh, a webinar addressing this uh, specific uh, issue by Dr. Susie Rayford, who is kind of our lead in development and the Weschler products and who has, uh, if you've seen any of our, our Pearson's documents that we've put out regarding kind of this very issue, uh, she is the author of those. And so I think uh, if you have time, you may find that rather informative. So, all righty. So, you know, it sounds like, uh, you know, the students have had barriers doing remote assessment. I think you've all been speaking to that pretty, very well, um, um, broadly. And indeed, it seems like even the students have brought in a certain level of motivation, as you shared, to facilitate their learning and adapting to this environment. Um, so, uh, so what have been your main sources of support as you've attempted to adjust to this new way of teaching? other than the students. <laughs> yeah. So I think um, other faculty members have been awesome. We've shared resources. In particular, um, the trainers and school psychologists have held a number of webinars during the summer. Um, and people just, uh, hundreds of people got together to talk about how are we going to do with this lesson and to share ideas and strategies to make this effective. And, and there's also a bunch of resources on their website in terms of COVID, uh, a number of resources surrounding COVID, um, one of which is assessment, but lots of different areas. And so it's really served um, within school site, I think, to be a really big source of support. All right. So has this created a uh, you know a financial impact or other systems impacts uh, that you, you all see um, that you had to adjust to, but that you think may kind of be a lasting effect for you all? Or institutional shifts? Go ahead. Sorry. There has been significant financial outlay at the beginning in terms of you know buying additional digital assets for use in our training clinic. And it's been very helpful to have the class pack for the classroom, um, but you know the outlay in the digital assets, some additional materials, for example, for training and in our clinic, we bought duplicates of some things so we could have someone have a material on one side of the plexiglass, someone have it on the mm -hmm. other side of the plexiglass or so that students could actually bring materials home with them so they wouldn't be coming in and out of the clinic for training. But, you know, the University of Virginia has, um, there are many remote rural areas in the part of the state, and we've long had people come from two hours away or so for meetings with us. And if we have an assessment that has an interview and an assessment day and the feedback, that's been a burden on families. And one of the things that I'm most excited about is that we now have the ability to meet the needs of people at a distance with it being less of an inconvenience for them. Mm -hmm. um, like even if they're coming in for a hybrid model, it can still be less traveling if we're doing the interview and the feedback portion mm -hmm. remotely. So it feels like it was a lot of work to make this pivot in the beginning, but I feel as though we're going to be reaping the benefits of it for a long time. Excellent. Excellent. So it's a systems change that's been brought about by this, but it's going to be sustained. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would second that. And I would say, again, we've had a lot of support. Being a regional university, one of our, our main missions is, of course, to serve our community and get more, more professionals out in a, in a, in a very, very rural area. And so our college has been more than supportive. Uh, we were fortunate enough to have uh, a, a clinic that's working very well financially. And so when we had this hit, you got to imagine all the clients we were seeing in the spring when COVID hit got put on hold till we figured everything out. And so really this fall has been finishing up those cases and staying in contact with those clients along the way to, to address any concerns and needs they've had in that during this period. Obviously, uh, one, one thing we're seeing with all of our kids, and you can imagine is their anxieties through the roof. You know, kids that are going back to school, mm -hmm. kids are doing remote work. A lot of stress in those homes. Doing these these remote sessions have been nice in the home uh, to see the home. It's actually been 
more insightful mm -hmm. to do these interviews uh, this way because you get a little bit more of their true selves and all the stuff that's going on in their day to day, the baby crying in the background and so on. So, um, mm -hmm. but, but again, I want to second that we, we've definitely taken a hit, but in the long run, um, we'll catch right back up and be fine. But we've had to be very thoughtful about the resources that we purchased and, and what we currently need versus what we hope to have. We always like to have a massive inventory of assessments our students can learn, but we've limited that this year um, for the sake of mastering the specific ones that we can do in teleassessment. So we've just had to pace ourselves a little bit. And again, with support from the university, I think we're going to come on top, but it definitely has taken a hit. So uh, it sounds like there's going to be a cohort of, uh, of evaluators, psychologists, uh, who are going to be quite adaptive <laughs> to this new environment based on the experiences and the learning they're getting, which is really kind of exciting. So, all right, let's go to uh, uh, next slide here. So, uh, you know, prior to when we were organizing this, we um, we did have some folks on the website who had posted some questions and um, and who, who wanted uh, – everybody to kind of comment on the hybrid uh, administration and how you could structure a hybrid administration. I think you've been doing that pretty well um, already. Um, but this was specific. I think they had to the WISC-5 with iPads. Um, you know, are all the manipulatives together? Do you keep the standard sequence? Uh, has there been adjustments that you've made in the actual delivery of, for example, the WISC uh, because of this? I, I will. I will take this one first. I guess uh, we we have stuck to the standard. We don't do block design. Um, we we have obviously not. We moved away from that, and we talked to our families about that. I mean, with the WISC, as you know, we're not going to produce a full scale score without block design. But we we want to be able mm -hmm. to do that, and and we explain that to our families. We we also more importantly again we do all those in the in the clinic, so we have all those things readily available on the shelf next to them, and we instruct them when to pull those over. I do know when I made the, the test run, I brought one of my daughters in and we did the whisk. And one thing we did learn, you, you just got to practice to find some of the, the little things that pop up. You know, you're worried about your students catching the ones and twos and prompting when they're supposed to. Um, but the one thing when you use those manipulatives is if you have a computer, for example, and you're doing a working memory or letter number sequencing. I noticed my daughter putting her fingers on the keypad and she was able to put her fingers on the numbers and the letters so that she could remember. And there's these little things that you catch. It's a nice creative uh, system she developed, right? But it helped us to recognize that the iPad sometimes for kids is better because they don't have that keypad in front of them. They don't need it. In, um, and it also gives them more space on the table. So there's just those little things as you do it, thinking a laptop versus an iPad. But we did keep that standard sequence. We found that that keeps them engaged when they're pulling those out and then shifting back to some of the on-screen administration. And for the classroom, how we dealt with block design was that any student who didn't have access to a paper and pencil kit, we just sent them a set of blocks. So they could still practice, they could still use it, uh, and it helped to, again, reinforce the importance of administering the test in a standardized fashion. We thought if we lost the blocks, it would be okay. <laughs> you know, and we hope <laughs> that, of course. But we've always saved them with every iteration of the Wexler scale. We saved the blocks and said we were able to mail it out. Thank you. We did the same thing, and I have to say, and we have had stacks and stacks of blocks in our clinic because every time we get a new kit for the past, you know, 20 years, the blocks have been, <laughs> at least that long have been the same. It's like, wow, we can put these key uses here. <laughs> Yeah, and those blocks don't degrade. One of our uh, internal uh, psychologists, when uh, COVID hit, uh, did what she could to try to destroy the blocks through like soaking them in bleach and everything, and they really held up pretty well. So uh, <laughs> if you've been around for a while, you probably have a lot of blocks. Okay. Um, so there's another question here. Uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, uh, at least on the healthcare side of things, uh, in private practitioners, and um, but you guys are probably also dealing with as well, is the use of... Um, uh, proctors. Uh, so what steps would be helpful uh, in training uh, proctors uh, in the home environment to help assist with remote administration of some of these tests? Or do you use them? <laughs> um, we, we don't use proctors. Because I'm sorry, go ahead. 
Um, no, you go ahead, Dr. Roth, and then we'll have Dr. Budget. Sure. So, um, so yeah, we. It's it's. Remind me of the question. I've lost my train of thought already. Oh, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's basically the use of pro how do you prepare proctors, whether it's okay. a family member or somebody sure. else, when you're doing remote assessment. Sure. Yeah, and, and again, unfortunately, we don't we don't use proctors because I'm coming from the clinic director side, thinking about when we have our students seeing clients um, from the community. And uh, in those cases, again, they're coming into the clinic where they have their own they have their own space, their own room, so we're able to not have to wear masks and be safe. And so the students doing that remote session from the other room, so we can see them live through that one way mirror. And those one way mirrors, I love the idea of putting glass in. I might take that idea moving forward. But for now, if you put those lights on, um, you can see through. And we always wave to our clients and let them know we're here. But again, we can see all that happening live with with the with the manipulatives and everything else. So we haven't had the use. For for a proctor. The one thing I will say for performance-based tests that's been helpful is we put tables outside of the testing room. So if there is a glitch or an issue to, to provide that no contact and really think about the safety of our clients that are coming in from the community, they're able to go out there, set anything down where they have questions or if the computer's had a problem so that we can then come out, address it, put it back on that table, they come back out, grab it, and we continue right where we left off. And so always just think about our student safety, but but also the safety of our clients has been paramount in this process. So again, we've done all performance-based tasks um, in the clinic, partially again, because we're in a very rural area and not a lot of homes in this area have high-speed internet that we can do a lot of these things without having a lot of technical techn technology issues. Mm -hmm. Dr. Blodgett, you wanna dive in? Oh, uh oh, go ahead. So we um, don't use proctors per se, you know, the way that some people do with a remote satellite office. Um, but we do need to involve the parent or the caregiver sometimes with the setup of the material. And parents are now more used to teleplatforms with kids who've been in school through distance learning. But in the beginning, um, in particular, we were having separate meetings with them so we could troubleshoot issues around setting up the technology and so we could get a sense from them of what things look like on the screen you know showing them how to hide their self view so that the child wouldn't be distracted or because we work as a team and sometimes we have a number of people observing a telehealth assessment how do you hide the non-video participants so that your screen is cluttered with those um, typically when people come into the clinic um, if it's a child, we'd have the child and both parents, this is pre-COVID, or one parent, you know, whatever the situation is with a caregiver, be there for the first five or ten minutes to help the child with a transition. And that can still be helpful by a telehealth, but then we now have the difficulty of getting the parent to leave. Um, <laughs> and that's been something that's been more of an issue is, wait a minute, were you just whispering that answer in the background? Um, and, you know, in an assessment recently, I was texting the parent to say we really needed to have her leave the room so that we could see what her child was able to do independently. But that's not usually an issue we have in the clinic because we can escort them out of the room. That was just something interesting that, that's come up a couple of times. Have, uh, do you use um, uh, additional cameras to uh, view other parts of the room other than the, the examinee? Yes, we've done that sometimes. We don't consistently do it. It just in terms of some of the limitations that people yeah. have with their own technology. Yeah. We also invested in, um, I can't remember what it was called, but it was less than $20. It was something that you could use to attach an iPhone to the edge of the table and then angle that. Mm -hmm. So that's what we've used sometimes as a, a separate camera. And then sometimes we just have them move the laptop over to the side when they're doing something pencil on paper so we can watch them without needing a second camera. Got it. Good. How about uh, um, so one of the questions that came up is projective. Do you guys uh, do projective tools? And the, the question was, how do you, uh, what's your success in administering those with reasonable reliability? Uh, or the MMPI 2 remotely, for example, being administered maybe orally? Do you guys do anything that? So our clinic does both and all, but again, um, unless they're coming into the clinic, that's why a lot of the questions really don't pertain to us because we are not doing remote assessment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Pat? Yeah. We have some questions from the uh, audience. 
Uh, one of the questions was, uh, has the has, um, university faculty tried uh, block design multiple choice and is that considered to be a good alternative to regular block design, number one? And number two, uh, do they have access to videos that actually demonstrate how to administer and score these tests? One university said that they have created their own, but can you share with the um, with the audience uh, what resources Pearson may be able to provide in that area too? Modules are great for so students to demonstrate the certificate after completing each of the different So, as opposed to us doing it, so they are available. There's a lot of wonderful Pearson resources available, not only for the modules in terms of administration, but nice case studies that I routinely use for students because it uses the same language. They don't have to be identified cases. There's the LE case, the majority, which are awesome. Okay. Others? All right. So um, this is a very specific question. It might, may be, uh, might be too specific from the, uh, the audience. Uh, so I enjoy the use of the Cattell Horn Carroll hierarchical model of intellectual functioning, uh, which is uh, knowledge, reasoning, spatial memory, and so on, in the assessment of children and young adults. The WISC 5 covers all these areas of the model except verbal, visual, spatial. Uh, for example, directions and visual knowledge, uh, for example, absurdities. What suggestions do you have to fill in these gaps in the assessment of intellectual abilities? All right, anybody? <laughs> might be too specific. <laughs> That's pretty specific. <laughs> We have, um, so I think, um, uh, I don't know, this has been an issue so much because you, you, I think your programs ought to change school psychs as well as clinical psychs, if, I, if I'm correct, at least some of you do. Um, have you had issues with school districts really accepting anything or interfacing uh, with what you're doing remotely? And it, or do you have maybe direct, less direct involvement with school districts? So we, 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 we have Oh, go ahead. <laughs> okay, uh, I was gonna say, we, we serve the charter schools in our area. We've done that for many years. Um, and so what we did is we, we tried to be proactive in, in March and May, starting to talk with them once they got there, got closer to, to May um, about what we wanted, how do we want to proceed in the fall. And um, so we met with them over the summer. We introduced our plans. You know, the first question and concerns is the safety of their students, whether they're doing remote learning, um, and what we have found is the charter schools have not required students who are doing remote learning families who are hesitant to go out in public and do anything. Um, we've put those on hold. Um, our school psych faculty have worked with them on interventions and different uh, aspects for each student independently for beyond an assessment to, to help them out. But for the students who are willing, the schools have been very open to our process. Again, we have a very strict guidelines when it comes to who comes and goes from the clinic. And um, in particular, you know, we do symptoms checks and temperature checks and all those things. And that makes the families feel comfortable. Um, and, then, and then most importantly, we talked to them about our process and there's no contact the entire time of the day. And so once we explain that process and we do that, uh, the families and the school board, and we haven't had many issues with that coming in to this point. But again, the engagement, getting a hold of parents has been more difficult. So that has been a, just a Par for the course with COVID is families kind of disappearing and staying in their homes. And so calling them and getting those return calls has been hard. But once we get them in, the, the kids, when they're the right age to be able to do tell assessment, um, have really responded. And we found creative ways to get them engaged. And we even bought markers for the mirrors so we can draw on the mirrors, play tic-tac-toe to get them warmed up before we start testing. Um, those kinds of things as well. And the schools have responded well to our strategies. 
So, do you want to say something uh, real quick? Awesome. Um, so we just got a, a notification that the, the, the meeting is going to end in about five minutes. Uh, I thought we originally had this scheduled for 90 minutes, but apparently that was uh, done in error. So um, are there any uh, final questions from the uh, audience that we could um, bring up before we wrap this up? Any final comments from the presenters <laughs> in closing? <laughs> Yeah, I was on mute before. And I was on mute before, so I wasn't able to say something. Um, yeah, we've been meeting with the local districts throughout the summer uh, because we're all in this together, and so we we talked about strategies. So, in, in response to your question about whether there have been issues with the districts in our um, clinics, um, you know, we're we're all kind of struggling with how best to assess children during these unprecedented times. So, yeah, and I, I think that's one area that we all need to kind of share information around um, because we're mm -hmm. all learning together. So any way that we can sort of mobilize the knowledge that we're all trying to make sense of independently would be really good. Excellent. Excuse Bryce. me, Excellent. Dr. Marianne. Yes. yes. If we would like yeah. to go the 90 minutes, I can schedule that so we can just keep on going. Oh, okay, good, because we all got this pop-up. Excellent. Let's just do that, yeah. and then we may not use the whole time. So. Perfect. <laughs> I'll Thank you. Pressure. <laughs> Thanks. Pat, we all do right. have questions from the audience, if you can hear me. All right. Pat? Go for it. Okay. Yep. For those of you who are involved in clinics, how do clients respond to that remote assessment? Um, this is Julia. So we have had a mix. I mean, there are some... Let me close my speaker again. Um, we have some clients who very much want to be remote, that they have their own concerns about COVID and are very glad for this option that we can do a remote assessment. And then there are other families who want it to be in person. Um, and, you know, fortunately, we're in a position currently where we're able to meet either of those needs, depending on what the family wants, so that, although that could change as, as COVID numbers change. Um, I think what's more difficult is when there are cases that would necessitate in person, you know, young children or children who might have greater difficulty staying focused. I think most of us would recognize that there is an increased difficulty with focus over telehealth. Um, we've been breaking sessions down into much shorter chunks than we used to to accommodate that. Um, but there are some cases where, you know, in-person isn't an option, yet it's the option we need uh, to address the, the questions that we have at hand, whether it's because of the questions themselves or because of the age of the child or developmental level. Um, Pat, I have uh, another question. Dr. Roth is going to Okay. No, you go ahead, um, respond to the last question, Dr. Roth? Yeah, that'd be, yeah, I'd like to, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Sure. Um, I, I will say our experience has been a little different. We we totally expected what, what Julia had mentioned to have about some clients not, not wanting to come in and vice versa, but almost every client that was on our wait list or was um, put on hold in the spring um, came in, uh, is willing to come in this time around. I think what I would advise is the, when you have your procedures in place, having those clearly described on, the, on your webpage, as well as when we've called to check and we've explained this process to them. It's taking time to answer all their questions and parents' concerns and so on. And once we've put that time in, they, they are, have been very open to coming in um, for testing. Now, I will say that we've had a cutoff on age. You have to understand that um, at a certain age, this isn't even, even coming in and doing that remote in-office session is not realistic. And so those kids that are in that six and eight range, it can... Um, it could be an honest conversation with the, with the families that, that this may not be the appropriate time. Um, and, and for our clinic, we're not able to do that. And they've responded well and stayed on our wait list, but uh, we do our best with any concerns they have in the interim. All right, Peter, go for it. Okay. Um, this is from Jennifer. She wants to know, has anyone had a COVID-19 exposure incident? And if so, how did the students in the clinic and the faculty cope with that? And how do you handle the delay? We have not had that 
that yet. I don't know if other people have, but we have fortunately not had that experience. Yeah, we have either that we're aware of, um, but you know there are standardized procedures within the university where where you know, students have to self evaluate every day and not come into the clinic or into the university if they have any symptoms, particularly a fever, uh, and any knowledge of COVID cases have to be reported within the university. Very good. Jennifer has another question. Uh, are schools accepting the results of teleassessment and are they considered valid by the schools? Yes, yeah, some of our local school districts are engaging in teleassessment. And so for us, um, you know, like we have been out of commission basically from March 13th until just a couple of weeks ago. And our school districts are feeling a lot of pressure to respond to timelines and to complete assessments. So it is just something that um, you know, locally we are doing. So, and they're doing it probably more than we are. So. You know, I believe the federal guidelines remained in place regarding the timelines when evaluations have to be done. So. My understanding is the schools weren't given the relief that COVID put on the pressure from the pressure. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I have a quick Kelly question. Wants to know. Okay, let me ask a quick, real quick question. Um, Go ahead. So, you know, with some of our hospital, uh, when we had the hospital panel, one of the things that they talked about, or some of the colleagues have talked about, is that when they send stuff home, uh, for like if they're doing a hybrid model, they treat the stuff being returned as a biohazard. Is this something that you have to think about implementing as well? Like paper, you know, like as I said, they're doing the coding or whatever. We looked at that. That is not something that I had considered, and I think of myself as a germaphobe at times. I mean, just from what I've read, like any infective agent would, you know, be disappearing over time or mm -hmm. no longer infective over time. So. You know, sometimes just isolating something for a while or if I'm handling it, just being careful with hand washing it afterwards, but we're not seeing it as something that needs to be disposed of, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we sort of responded to that with the actual, with all of the test kits. So when students borrow kits from our testing library, we quarantine our kits for a couple of days rather than wash them down for fear of, you know, like causing damage to the kits. So they, they are quarantined for like three to five days and then we rotate the test kits. And we do the same with the test kits as well. You gotta be careful not to have them wiping down all the pages that will, will certainly ruin yeah. those pages. Um, but yeah, we put them, we call it on vacation. We put them on vacation for a few days and they come back out of vacation. Okay, excellent. Go ahead, Peter. Uh, one of the questions was, has uh, 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 the university faculty had any concerns about their APA approval? Has APA actually uh, changed any requirements during this pandemic? And is this something that uh, they can share with the audience? Yeah, there's been a lot of communication from APA, um, and there, there is flexibility around how uh, you know, the way in which we deliver education and training. The focus is on competency because they understand how needs to come first. So there's been a lot published, and you can also find it on the TSP website. We're actually in the midst of reaccreditation, and we're on hold. They're not even doing site visits, um, and that won't occur at least for already accredited program in the earliest next year. So uh, I really think it will come out quick and um, it was really a good safety force. So I think please talk. All right. Any, any more uh, questions or comments? Peter? No, but we encourage people to keep putting questions in the chat box. One person did want to know if this uh, was going to be recorded so she could listen to it later. Sherry, was this recorded? Yes, I can speak to that. One half hour after the conclusion of this webinar, the recording will be accessible using your login for this webinar. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, if that's it, then I think we can probably wrap this up. I want to thank our presenters for giving us uh, their insights and experience in uh, adapting and uh, adjusting to the COVID world. And um, I hope that um, we can continue to have success as we move, move forward into, uh, uh, into the future. So um, appreciate your participation and appreciate the audience uh, and joining us today. Have a good day.